So the other day I was with a group of friends, enjoying the sun, consuming some beers. I tell myself that that's a form of escapism from capitalist alienation, but maybe, just maybe, it's just addiction. But let's continue. And at some certain point in our conversation, one of us called the other a lib in a very derogatory way. It was very easy to understand that, which kind of created confusion in a person who was with us, which was followed by the question about the topic. Me and my friend, being the sofa analyst that we are, gladly tried to explain to this young sir why lib or liberal was a derogatory term for us, which to be honest, turned out to be an interesting task. The reality is that those of us who are communists or anarchists in many ways self-isolate ourselves in our own slur and language, which we use constantly in our discourse, that for those who have no knowledge about the matter sounds weird. That in itself gave me an idea. Why not to do a virtual video about it? a reflection on liberalism, as an ideology mainly, and to do it not in too very radical way, while still preserving my essence, my ideology. So, today that's exactly what I'm gonna try to do. Liberalism. The most popular form of political philosophy on our planet, it originated in Europe and later was imposed into everyone around the world. Just like nationalism and other ideas that drive themselves from capitalism, it's in all of us. We can't run away from it. Even those people who call themselves apolitical, in reality, are just liberals. Not because they choose so, but because that's the status quo. It is the most dominant political and economical structure for the last 200 years. Liberalism, like many ideology, drives itself from the material reality. Or at least, that's what I believe. So let's speak about it. If you ask any liberal what are the main characteristics of liberal ideology, he will probably answer something like the right to private property, equality between humans, importance of human life, individualism, importance of free market, etc. etc. But as liberal favorite writer once said, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal. And here we come to liberal first major contradiction, the problem of private property and its direct opposition to human equality. So, on one side, we say that everyone is equal. On the other side, we acknowledge and protect the private property in its accumulation, being the paradox here on how can we be equal if I'm a low-class scum and you are a landlord who owns more than a dozen properties. How can a single mother have the same political power as the owner of multinational media corporate that could control the narrative to his advantage? And the same thing could be applied not only in terms of political equality, but also in equality regarding the law. How can we be equal in front of the law if I can barely afford a meal and you can afford to buy the best lawyers in the world? And unfortunately, our world and even daily life is full of examples where little men got completely destroyed by some corporation or wealthy individual in court. And before you start writing comments with stories about contra-examples, I will anticipate your move and remind you that for those stories that you're about to write are not the norm but an anormality in the system. For one of those stories you can easily find 1000 demonstrating the contrary because the core of liberal ideology is private property. The individual and his liberties should be protect, protected alongside his property but the property of each individual are different so it means that the protection that you're gonna get also are different. Another form in which we can perceive this duality is in our workplace. Because despite being all individual, living in a supposedly free, liberal democracy, when we are all together in a workplace, it doesn't matter who you are. A minimum wage worker, engineer, manager, etc. All your liberties and power of decision are set aside in favor of the Vin Moir, which we call our businessman, entrepreneur. This, in turn, creates a very big contradiction inside the liberal system, a contradiction that's been haunting in the ideology since its inception. The origins of liberal ideology can be traced to people like John Locke, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Adam Smith, and many other philosophers from the 17th and 18th century. And even before it became the dominant ideology, we could trace the same kind of contradiction. Locke, for example, wrote a lot about equality and human liberties, but at the same time, he was part of the first bourgeoisie, the sea bourgeoisie. I'm talking about people who profit tons out of slave trade and the exploitation, the death comes in the new world, or as historians call them, sugar plantation. In the same philosophers, 
we can see that despite defending equality and individualism, many of them were in favor of slave trade and in favor of expropriation of land belonging to the Native Americans, being the main argument the fact they didn't have a concept of private property and because of that they are lesser human. Argument that for me is very funny to read and hear. Now I'm gonna do a small side note. I know it's not related to the topic, but I just want to leave here the fact that race and racism as we know it today were invented after the beginning of the slave trade, being the interesting fact about this ideology that it shares a lot of thinkers in common with liberal ideologue. Maybe one day I'll talk more in details about this, but not now. So the previous point brings us to another interesting characteristic of liberalism, which we can call ideological elitism. From its, from its inception, liberal ideology and its ideologues always position themselves as the supreme ideology, neglecting all other ideologies inferior on a political evolutionary scale, which in itself is a hilarious affirmation, but nonetheless one that is very much adopted by all liberals, that consider that liberalism is the best system that humans can achieve. To neglect its internal contradiction, it's a long-lasting chain of thought practiced by the 18th century philosopher and nowadays liberals, like when liberalism was pronounced the end of history not so long ago. So, if liberal society is the pinnacle of what humans can achieve politically, then the following question arises. How does the liberal see a perfect organization of society? So, theoretically, in their view, it should be a very small government that is created to preserve the personal liberties of the individual and his property by creating certain structures like the police or even the army and more. In order to preserve those values, the liberal state passes and adopts laws that imposes the liberal homogeneity on society. So putting this small issue aside, how should a perfect multi-party liberal government function? In theory, besides being as small as possible, it should be self-controlling and self-regulating. There should be many centers of power and there should be a clear separation of power, and if all those institutions fail to hold their task and the government becomes dysfunctional, the people have the divine right to overthrow it, to do a revolution, or at least this is what the theory defends. In practice, we see that the liberal government at this point implements a bunch of structural mechanisms and instruments in order for this not to happen. Using this part of the theory, maybe as an excuse or as a facade when overthrowing governments of countries that don't ally with their interests. Basically, if the government is organized by liberal values, it should not be overthrown. If it's not a liberal democracy and doesn't respect liberal values, mainly the right of private property, more precisely the right of the other countries to steal its national resources, then it should be taken down. But as many of you might suspect, I'm a Marxist. So for me, as a Marxist, will be in general not to look at liberalism in regards to its economical structure. Because like any other ideology, liberalism arrives from certain material condition, in this case capitalism. So here comes another talking point common in liberalism, the free market, or the invisible hand of the market. For liberals, a perfect society should be regulated by the market itself, and in majority of cases, not all, the free market or unregulated trade between equal individuals could resolve all society's problem. Or at least, this is the liberal dogma, Helsin's Adam Smith. So in order to maintain this societal balance, we should have the freest market possible, in conjunction with a small government that should be there to resolve the economical crisis that occur time to time. At this point, we had so many crises that destroyed so many lives that it made the government interfere a lot of times, creating certain regulations in order to prevent societal collapse. Not to better our lives, but to prevent us from eating them alive. And I cannot stress this enough, but the majority of good things we have in our lives, like holidays, weekends, 8 hours workdays, etc., are results of hundreds of years of working class struggle and not liberalism benevolence. As a result of these mechanisms that benefit the majority of population, liberalism has been pushing very strongly against it, and they are succeeding, mainly through the new way to approach of liberalism, like neoliberalism. There are tons of videos on YouTube, so if you are curious about it, just check those out. I'll leave some that I think are really good. But very briefly, neoliberalism is an ideology that runs on a static of reduction of the state, where in reality, 
it expands the state and its forces, but mainly as an extension of the financial market. Basically, the state should exist only to economically support the businesses. Right now, in my opinion, neoliberalism is the dominant form of liberalism in the West, and there are many variations with neoliberalism that I could go over in this video, but maybe I'll leave this for another time. But besides neoliberalism, there are only two variations that I'll love to mention here. First one is so-called anarcho-capitalism, which basically advocates for a complete destruction of the state and regulation of society exclusively according to the market, which in my opinion is nothing but brain rot symptom. There's a lot of contradiction in this ideology, although the biggest one in my opinion being the failure to acknowledge that private property could not exist without the state. And without private property, there could not be such thing as called the market. Because if there's no state, is there no police, there's nothing stopping the workers from taking out the factory. And the second one that I want to talk about is the social liberalism, which is the rare periods when liberalism is more concerned with maintaining social order and the well-being of the individual than, than the economical part in itself. Good examples of this is post-war Europe or USA after the Great Depression. Usually these periods are not very long lasting, and after they are over, the majority of implemented measures are pulled back, like during Reagan or Thatcher, causing a big societal disorientation, as we are experiencing right now. There is a few conclusions that I could draw from here, but before briefly enumerating them, I would like to state that liberalism as a manifestation of capitalism, both of them were very useful to human development, especially in its inception. But, right now, they both outlive their uselessness, and their existence is more harmful to human existence than anything else. So that being said, what are the main takeaways from here? Liberalism has many shapes and forms, but at its core, there's always the private property as the dominant value, and sometimes the individualistic right of ban. Although, as history has shown us, the private property dominates liberal ideology. Liberalism rose from capitalism, material condition, and it's intrinsically connected to capitalist system. Liberal democracy is a form of elitocracy, a form of government where the elites are in constant competition with each other, and those who are not part of those elites can only choose to play around the boundaries already stipulated by the elites. Liberalism is a very fluid ideology that can take many forms while maintaining its core values intact. These characteristics allow it to be very resistant to any kind of social criticism and political turmoil. Doesn't matter who is the face of it, the system remains intact. And since it's very individualistic ideology, it can very easily put the blame on a specific leader and not on the system. Thus, it might change its form, but never the core. So with this, my video comes to a conclusion. Um, like, subscribe, share with your grandma, you know, the usual stuff that they say. And I'm gonna mumble for a bit, so um, I advise you to turn off the video, but if you remain here, it's because you're a reviewer of mine and you're interested in, in what I'm gonna do next. So first of all, I'm really, really sorry that it took me so long to create this video. As some of you may know, like uh, at least one person that I'm really, really grateful to that actually inspired me a lot to not give up and to make the video. Uh, I originally was planning to make a video about violence, specifically about revolutionary violence, uh, more precisely based on theory of Hans Fanon. Those of you who don't know, I highly recommend reading The Register of This World, it's very, very interesting. And mainly how violence can be liberating in a situation of oppression. So as Initially, I was planning to make just uh, in terms of um, colonial liberation, but then I start uh, thinking about intersecting the um, Fanon theory with the uh, Gramsci theory of cultural homogeny and how we are culturally colonized by the ruling class. And yeah, that took me to very far away path. So I had the script wrote already, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna do it. At least not for now, because 
the more I read about it, the more I understand, the more I don't know. So I planning to do a video about it. Maybe it's going to be like a long lasting project. Maybe it will take me a long time, but I think I will release it at some point. Uh, yeah, but, uh, if you're curious what I'm going to do next, um, I want to get some more historical video because this video is very theoretical. So I'm probably going to do a video about Chile about the Pinochet coup and I, want, I don't know that there's a lot of stuff about that but more I think one of the things that there's like you lacking in the left YouTube is like instead of talking so much about Allende uh, to focus a lot on the economical part of Pinochet rules which is very very interesting and very very telling I would say very very telling in many perspectives or I want to do a video about uh, a coup that happened in modern day in Russia in 1993, which in my opinion would be also very, very interesting because um, it's the day that the Russian, Russian democracy died, let's put it that way. So yeah, that are my plans. If you're listening, this is because you care and thank you very much. And yeah, and I hope uh, the next video will be soon. I, I, I think it will be sooner because it's a historical video, it's much easier to make. So yeah, thank you, bye.